obviously can't be in two places. Worksheets. Anybody need a worksheet or a test? We've got a quiz. Just like last quarter with Daniel, we had the quizzes for over Daniel over the previous lesson. So that's what we'll start with this morning. And, you know, I never thought about it when I, when I sent Hal the PowerPoint that you guys are going to be looking all the way down there to see what's on the PowerPoint. Hope you brought your binoculars this morning. Oh, it's on there too. Oh, yeah. Well, see, I can't even. I never would have thought of that. I never, I never sit in the back. I'm a real Christian. I sit down towards the front. So, <laughs> all right. Well, welcome to all of you guys, of course, and welcome to anybody who might be watching online, and special welcome to uh, anybody who might be viewing this video from Owatonna. Those guys, they sent us a very nice card. So appreciate. Owatonna, Minnesota. All right, let's get started with our quiz. This is over last week's lesson. If you weren't here last week, uh, got any questions or observations to make, please let it be known. Number one, where or what were the five views about Revelation which our class materials presented? Number one was the destruction of Jerusalem. That's one view. Number two, or B, fall of Rome. That's another view. C, prediction of blank and blank history, religious and political history. It's a, some think it's just a view of political and religious history, or religious and political history, either one of those, fill in the blanks. D, philosophical principles, and E, events around the blank of the blank, end of the world. That's perhaps one of the most popular views. Which of the views did the class materials favor? And your present teacher, and that is the fall of Rome. Fall of Rome. It's about the church being persecuted and, and God bringing judgment on those who were persecuting his people. Number three, the first of five keys to understanding Revelation is that the book is written in symbols or apocalyptically, apocalypse, it's an apocalypse, an, an apocalypse, you may recall we talked about this at least in brief, today the word apocalypse is, is used of an end of the world scenario, but apocalypse, all that means is away from hiding, apocalypto, uh, which is not the name of the ship that John Denver sang about. Uh, that's away from hiding. It's a style of writing. It was in symbols and figures, but it was in symbols and figures for specific people who would know what those symbols and figures were. And so for them, it was, it was like a code that was revealing things. Um, when I was in grade school, the big thing was pig Latin. And I didn't know any pig Latin. I, didn't, I thought that was silly. I didn't want to learn it. So my friends would be around me talking in pig Latin. And I go, what are they talking about? Well, they knew what they were saying. I didn't know what it was. So they were speaking apocalyptically for themselves. Number four, the second of five keys to understanding Revelation is that the book says its events will happen blank from the time of its writing. Soon. They will be shortly to come to pass. And remember, a point that made a lot of impact with me is this is a literal statement. If we can't understand the literal statements to mean what they say they mean, how can we hope to understand the symbolic things or the figures? So that's a very clear, literal statement. These things are written and they're going to happen soon. Where does it say that? Generally speaking, it says it at the very beginning and at the very end. Chapter 1, the first couple of verses, and chapter 22, it says it again, comes back to it. The third of five keys is to understanding the revelation is that the book says it is offering blank to Christians who are suffering blank. What's the first blank? Comfort. Comfort to Christians who are suffering persecution. Remember in the first chapter, John said, I, your brother and fellow partaker in the 
tribulation, the tribulation. And the tribulation is not something that's coming near the end of the world. As a matter of fact, in, in chapter 24 of Matthew, Jesus talks about a tribulation that will be worse than anything that had ever happened, and there won't be anything any worse ever happened. And that was the destruction of Jerusalem took place in A.D. 70, and if you're not familiar with that tribulation and how tribulating it was, read Josephus' account of the fall of Jerusalem, and you will probably agree once you read what Josephus said about what happened to those inside Jerusalem. Well, and it wasn't the Romans that did it. It was those Jewish folks inside Jerusalem who did not believe in the Messiah that did that to themselves, and it was horrific. The fourth of five keys to understanding the revelation is that the book identifies some of its cast of characters. A, the dragon represents Satan. The first beast, seven heads, ten horns, represents Rome. The second beast, two horns like a lamb, represents the blank of emperor blank. The cult of emperor worship. And seven, the fifth key to understanding Revelation is that it identifies the prostitute as the blank of blank. City of Rome. Okay, any questions or observations, any comments on any of these things? Well, then we'll move on to our second lesson. Time seems to be so limited. Yes. Okay. And then as I've grown and of course learned this wasn't available, readily available <clears throat> insights that you're getting. And I and it's stuck in my mind the things that stick out like add to or take away from the things that are written in this book. Or wormwood. Or, you know, behold, you know, talking about the churches, or behold I knock. Just but the whole thing didn't stick. Just certain things that I could understand it. I, right. I hope I knew. And it's just amazing to listen to it now and think, wow, I, I really didn't know. Right. Well, it's kind of like learning a language uh, in a way. And you start out, if you're listening to somebody speak Spanish and you don't speak Spanish, you'll probably go, well, I don't understand any of that. And then they will say something in Spanish that you're familiar with, a, a Spanish word, and you go, oh, I know what that word is. I know what Cinco is. That means five. Uh, so, but the more you listen, the more you learn, and pretty soon you, you can speak Spanish if you're applying yourself to understand Spanish. And it's the same with the Revelation. You, you just have to learn what's being said. And it takes time. Give yourself time. Everything takes time. No matter what you're doing, if you're learning a new skill, it's going to take time, and it doesn't come overnight. Little, little children can learn language very quickly. I wish they could explain to us how they do it. But it's fascinating that they can listen to people talk and pick up a language. And with a few corrections, they can, they can do amazingly well. When we get older, it's more difficult. I think that's one of the reasons why Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. So you'll pursue him, and you'll read these things, study these things, meditate on these things, and you'll, you'll figure things out a little more quickly, perhaps. But some of, it, some of it only comes with age and experience. You finally figure things out. And I've made a lot of changes in the way I've thought down through the years. All right, worksheet for lesson number two. The Apostle Blank wrote the book of Revelation when he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Which apostle? John. Okay, and there's the island of Patmos. That's Turkey. It was called Asia Minor uh, in the Bible, but that's the, at the edge of Turkey. And I've got a few pictures. We got to go to Patmos. There's not much to see, though, really. Uh, there's a, see, there, there's the location of the island right there. Well, I'm pointing at the screen on the, <laughs> but, but there's a, an aerial view. 
And that red thing is where the supposed cave is. There is a cave there, but that's supposedly where John stayed when he was on Patmos. <clears throat> Nobody knows for sure. There's another view of the island as we're coming into port. It's a decent sized island. I always pictured it as a little bitty rock that he was exiled to, but it was a, it was a decent sized island. People live there. There are businesses there, of course. And I put this picture in there. Number one, I want you to see my lovely grandchildren. But we're walking up to the hill and that, that white building to the left of Liam's head is the building they have built over top of the cave. So you get into port, you walk up this trail, and you go to this place and stand in line. We, there's lines of people. Of course, you know, you're on a cruise ship, so everybody on a cruise ship is going at the same time. And you want to go in and you want to see this place where they're saying that this is where John lived. This is where he stayed. It may have been. Uh, we don't know. But he was on this island, and the views that we saw are probably the kind of views that he would have seen. So this is the place, just so you'll have a little bit of familiarity with some of the landscape of the island of Patmos. Not a, not a dinky little island. Uh, there are much smaller ones, but this one uh, was, was pretty good size. Okay, John wrote the Revelation. What's the next one? He was on the island of Patmos. And there again, this is uh, from the... PowerPoint provided with the lesson, you can see the seven churches of Asia to which the letters will be dictated in chapters 2 and 3. So here's our next question. Number two, John saw the vision on the Lord's Day. That's what he calls it. He doesn't say first day of the week. He just says Lord's Day. When he was in the Spirit. A lot of good reasons to call the first day of the week the Lord's Day. That was the day Pentecost pointed to, the 50th day after seven Sabbaths, uh, the day of the resurrection. All four gospel writers focus on the first day of the week, so that would seem to be the day. John saw one who looked like a man but was radiant. He said he was the blank and the blank and the blank one. This is from chapter one. He was the first and the last and the living one. This is from, uh, there you go, verse 11. Nope, not 11. What did you say? There you go, end of 17 and 18. He was walking among seven lampstands. King James will say candlesticks because they used candles when the King James was written, but these were actually lampstands. By the way, we're going to go through this, and we're going to come back and, and deal with the text in a little more detail. Should have told you that up front. Number four, Jesus asked John to write down what he saw and blank it to seven blanks. Write down what he saw and send it to seven churches. From the church in Ephesus, we learned that Jesus blanks us very well. And this is one of the things that it's a common element in the letters. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, he knows us, knows us very well. And he likes it when we take a blank against those who do not teach the truth. Take a stand. That's what they did in Ephesus. And Jesus spoke approvingly of that in the letter. Number 6. From the church in Smyrna, we learn that even if we are blank in this world's goods, 
we can be truly blank. If we're poor in this world's goods, we can be truly rich. Do not lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through, but lay up treasures in heaven. Which makes you wonder, what can you lay up in heaven? And the answer would be, everything you do by faith. Everything you do by faith in God. Number seven, from the church in Pergamon, we learned that Jesus wants us to avoid worshiping blank and avoid blank sins. Avoid worshiping idols and avoid sexual sins. Number eight, from the church in Thyatira, we learn to be... Oh, what's that? Oh, we should let blank set our standards. And this didn't come out of the text, but it's Jesus. Let Jesus set our standards. We are disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. We learn from Jesus. He's the one that sets our standards. And it, which is a, that's one of the things about keeping his statutes. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 8. Keep my words, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. To keep his statutes doesn't mean you're always doing them perfectly. It means that that's the standard by which you judge yourself. If you say, well, I did wrong. Well, how do you know you did wrong? Well, because I see what Jesus said about right and wrong, and that's the standard that I use. You don't use the world standard. You don't use your own standard. You use Jesus' standard, and, and that is keeping his standards in that sense. Number eight, from the church in Thyatira, we learn to be blank in our service, growing, growing. And then there are two thought questions. Number nine, I could improve my service to Christ by, think of something you can do to improve your service to Christ. What, what do you think you're weak in right now that you could improve on? What gifts do you have that you might not be using to their full potential? You have gifts that God has given you. You have resources that God has put in your hand, in your mind, one way or another, what do you have that you could use more effectively and efficiently for the cause of Christ? Who do you know that you could reach out to with the gospel that you may not be reaching out to right now? These are the kinds of questions we ask ourselves about a lot of things. You get home at night, you're hungry, yeah, I'm going to fix myself something good to eat. Well, what do you do? You start looking at what you've got available. You got a pantry, you got a refrigerator, you got a freezer. You start looking for what you might be able to make into a meal. And some of you are pretty good at it. That's the kind of thing we do with our Christianity. Yes. So what you're saying there about what can we do? And I I struggle trying to tell people and it just like like we talked about the, you know the fertile ground and, the, and, the, and, and the different types of soil whether it's received but then we have to remember that God gives the we got to trying to make it grow right <clears throat> but then I think about it's the elders one of the elders I just love and I love him and I'm, I hate to say it but I probably love him more than the others but I still love the others <laughs> But the way he says a prayer, mm -hmm. the way he approaches you in love and he's humble. And I think about this truth, this great truth that we've been given that can save us. And what can I do? I can be humble. I can be like Jesus. I think about that passage where it says that if we hate our brother, we murder him. Right. And I struggle with this things in the past and, and and realize that I can't, I'm a murderer. I mean I've got to be humble. Be loving. I've got to have a contrite heart. I've got to have what Jesus showed. In that, forgive them, God. They know what they do, and they were killing. 
I've got to have that. Right. And then maybe if I plan to see God in the instead of pushing people away. Right. Now, I think when we read these letters, we're saying Jesus, he's starting the revelation with seven letters, each one to a congregation of the church that has its strengths and its weaknesses. And he's saying, here's what I like about you. Here's what you need to correct. And the impact of that, in my mind, is as I read through these things, oh, okay, well, what if he wrote me a letter? Not just to the church at Choctaw. That's another thing to consider. But what if he wrote Marty Kessler a letter? What would he say about Marty Kessler? And the first thing he'd say is, I know your deeds. That's what he says to, to the church at Ephesus. And that's what he says to every. He knows. He knows. He knows and he sees our lives every day. So, okay, he, he sees my life. What could I do to make my life more glorifying to him? Because the, the thing is, the natural selfishness that we have tends to make us focus on ourselves. But the more we focus on God, the better it is for myself. And at the end of the day, as we like to say it now, I'm going to find myself in a much better way having focused on God rather than myself. Harold? I think what you said is certainly true. At times we have, we're so busy we can't do anything, but I think probably one of the biggest problems is I don't really know how to get started. Right. And so I have uh, understood that one of the things you might do if you're trying to talk to somebody to maybe get them interested in finding out the Bible, maybe you're not going to teach them the first thing, but maybe you could ask them, what kind of difficulties you've got that I could pray for you? Build that relationship that could give you an opportunity in the future if you press, you know, if you pushed on with it. Right. There's an idea. Do you know what a tackle box is? Yeah, everybody knows what a tackle box is, even if you don't fish. It's a box, and what's the fisherman got in there? All kinds of different, yeah, everything. <laughs> All kinds of lures. Uh, because if one doesn't work, you, you pull that one in and you t tie, tie on another one, throw it out there. And you try different techniques. You fish on the bottom. You, you, you get a sinker that sits on the bottom, and you raise your hook a few inches up, and you put your bait just off the bottom. You'll use a float so the bait's hanging. And you'll do, why do you do that? Because if the fish aren't biting one way, you're going to try another way. That's why we do that. That's why fishermen do that. You just keep fishing. You don't stop fishing. You don't say, oh, I'm going home. No, you keep fishing. You just find another way to do it. And this is the most important thing we could be doing is shaping our, our minds and our hearts and our lives after Jesus Christ. There's no more important activity we could ever be involved in. I think it's important too to realize your people you're talking to, there is an outcome for them. It's going to be either heaven or hell. Yes. And they're on that route. And so if you take a little time, it's worth it. If you don't try, you fail for sure. You may not be successful, but you try. Right. Amen. You're always failing if you don't try and... Another thing that you can observe is that God, even God, can't bless an effort you don't make. But if you make the effort, you never know. You're standing in the, the aisle there at Walmart looking at car batteries or something. And somebody comes up and, and they're looking, they start looking at the same thing you're looking at there. Man, wish I knew which one to get. Is that, well, there's a, let's read this book. Oh, uh, you know, that's... There's another book you could read to figure out what you need. That's the Bible. You ever read the Bible? Just, and they might say, oh, I'm getting away from you. <laughs> but you've tried. Or they might say, well, you know, I've been thinking about reading the Bible. Because you never know. Is God at work? Of course he's at work. And how many coincidences have you run into where, oh, this person might be ready to talk about something that I, I would never have even imagined that they were ready to talk about? Mike? The mail that we receive from Bible Bob Clock, the most common phrase that the letter begins with is, I stumbled across. I stumbled across your website as I was surfing the net or as I was on YouTube, but it's always I stumbled or I accidentally, very rarely did they write, I was searching for a particular thing. You right. Know, uh uh. They, they find us by, you know, by chance. Is it by, 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 by providence? Yeah. yeah. Is it any wonder then that Jesus told that parable as walking through this field and found a treasure? Oh, 
I didn't know that. was. I wasn't looking for it, but there it is. Now, another guy was looking for a pearl, and he found it, and he sold everything he had to have it. But this other guy wasn't looking for that treasure in the field, and yet he found it. And when he did, he sold everything he had to have that field. So we don't know. It's, it's there. John, uh, Don? I'll use the example that we were, we're talking about shrinking back and talking about Jesus with others as a, as a sin of omission or you know, a, a sin that we struggle with, let's say. We're, we're, we struggle with that. The way I, the, the nuts and bolts that I use well, in my walk with God is instead of, a, and it, this could be any sin, but let's say I, I know that I'm shrinking back. You know, I when I first started Christianity, I knew I was shrinking back, so I would, I would avoid social situations. I thought, well, I won't talk about Jesus because I know I'm going to shrink back and I'm not going to do, you know. And, and I was trying to do everything myself. I need to do this for the Lord so I'll be good enough, you know. And so now the way I, I, I do it is I know that at some point I'm probably going to shrink back in certain social situations. I mean, I know it's inevitable. But when I... Instead of but pulling up my bootstraps and saying, well, I, I just need to go do it because someone might go to hell, so I better do it. I just talk to the Lord about it, no matter what sin it is. I mean, it, we're using the example of shrinking back. So now I'll go into social situations, and and I, I find myself shrinking back. And if I do, I either talk about right there in the middle of the conversation, I'm talking to God about it right then, or later I talk and say, you know, you know I'm shrinking back here. I probably should have said this, or I should have said that, or I should have done this. And I just talk to God about it. And it seems like he changes me from the inside out on ways to move in, in a, instead of a, a, a hard fashion, well, you, you need to find Jesus. Well, you need Jesus, you know, instead. But you start, you start moving in where they're at. And you start planting seeds. And you start moving in. You may not even get to completely to Jesus and baptism and all, and all of that, you know, the full right. measure of being in the church. You know, but you start planting seeds about Christ. You start moving them into good and, and, and that and he, he's, the Lord's taught me through that way, just telling God about your sins. Even in the middle of them, it's like, just talk to him. And, and he begins to change me and, and mold me and, and move me. And, and then I naturally begin to overcome many of the things that I was just trying to button up my bootstraps and do it again. And I believe that's what's walking in the light, keeping his statutes before you. Talking to him about your sins, struggling with them, and, and just and, and not afraid to just go talk to him about it. Instead of like I did for years, walked away and ran from him because I didn't want to talk to him anymore. I thought I had to be good enough for him. Right. So anyway, well, that's that's my nuts and bolts on how I try to work it. You know. It's it's biblical, of course, because we're you know we're reading these letters that Jesus sent. Well, you, you get to the last one, Laodicea, and that's the the worst congregation because they're lukewarm. And he says, "I'm going to spit you out of my mouth." But then, what's the last thing he says in chapter three and verse twenty to the church at Laodicea? He says, "Behold, I stand at the door and I, I knock. If anybody wants to open up to me, and that that's what he's always trying to get us to do: open up to him." He says, "I'll come in and, and sit down, and we'll have a meal." And that's fellowship, and that's what we want with God. And he wants to have fellowship with us. I do not know why. Can you figure that out? If you can figure out why the, the, the one who is able to speak everything into existence that is wants to have fellowship with me, it's not about who and what I am. It's about who and what he is, and he does love us, and that's... That's the issue right there. He is greater than I could imagine him being. That's why I can't have, imagine him wanting to be around me. But he does because he's greater. Number 10, a door Christ is open for me is, and that's probably something you'll need to think about on your own and answer for yourself. Yes? Do we do nine? Yes. I can improve my service to Christ by... That's what all of that previous discussion was, was pretty much about. How can we improve our service to Christ? So there's no, in other words, there's no set answer for number 9 and 10. You have to fill that out from your personal uh, experience. What's that? Stepping up to the challenge? Yes. Yeah. 
Christ loved us enough to face our rejection. You know, the love of the people, they don't know what they did. I mean, my goodness, we're dealing with the life and word of God here in life. And, you know, it's just amazing how it affects different people, but it's the same goal. And I, I don't know who I was talking to recently, but I was at a, I was at a fishing show years ago. And they brought in this big fish tank that was like the size of a tractor trailer. And they filled it with water and they put a bunch of nice bass in there and some habitat rocks and bushes and things. And then a guy stood up at the end of it and he would throw lures in there. And you could see how those lures would work in the water. And there was this one huge bass and he kept throwing this lure. And it would just drop perfectly right in front of him and he'd just sit there. And, and he did that. And about the seventh time he did that, finally that old bass said, I've had enough of this. Maybe he was aggravated. I don't know. But he grabbed that lure, and the guy pulled him out of there. It's like, okay, well, there's, that's evangelism. You keep, you keep trying. You keep asking. You keep talking. As long as they don't turn you away, keep bringing it up. And, and you don't have to be ugly or hateful about it, like, like Don was saying. Or, i got to get you right to the water. Just, hey, how, how are you and the Lord doing today? That... Uh, Things are looking pretty rough in the world. Do you, are you ready for this world to end? Whatever it might be, find a way to ask. Find a way to... And you get a lot of rejection. It's never fun. A lot of rejection. But you never know. When the next person might be the one, like you may have had before, that said, yeah, I, I would like to talk about that. So keep going. If nothing else, out of faith in Jesus... Number 11, from Laodicea, we learned that if we wander away from Christ, we should repent. Number 12, all the letters promise great rewards to those who overcome, to he who overcomes. Every one of these letters has that phrase in it, he who overcomes. This is from the Greek word Nike. Nike. There was a goddess named Nike. Oh, I meant to get a picture of her. And by the way, I'm not using the PowerPoint. He made this great PowerPoint, and I'm, I'm not even using it. And there's a picture, an artist impression. This came right out, of, right out of the Bible. Artist impression of what that one might have looked like. Each lampstand represented a church. Jesus dictates to John a letter to send to each of the seven churches of Asia. And then you got the location noted on the maps, and there it is on the map again. So these are all pretty close together. They're not all scattered around. In, in my opinion, it doesn't say, but these seven churches represent every church in one way or another. We can all find ourselves in the addresses to these churches. And Jesus knows us very well. Likes us to take a stand. You can recognize these answers in the past. I'm, I'm not very good at using somebody else's PowerPoint. And this is Pergamum. This is what was going on there. One of the things I would like to do, though, before we, we finish out this morning. Oh, I better hurry then. Um, you look at the description of Jesus. Verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man. Where does that phrase, son of man, come from? Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. So when the reader would see this, if they were a good Bible student like they should have been, they would, oh, son of man, he's talking about the son of God. Talking about Jesus. What did Jesus call himself throughout the Gospels? Son of man, son of man, son of man. Oh, that's Jesus. Now the rest of the world might not have a clue who he's talking about, but Christians would know. That's the idea of apocalypse, away from hiding. I'm telling you it's the son of man. Oh, well, that's clear to me who that is. If, if you're a Christian and know how Jesus spoke and what Daniel said. Verse 13, continuing, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. What does that sound like to you? 
Anything biblical? You go back to Exodus 28 where we read about the description of the clothing that was to be made for the priests. And Jesus is, of course, our high priest. And so we're seeing someone who is like the Son of Man, and he's also priestly with a golden sash. Verse 14, his head and his hair were like white like wool. <clears throat> Daniel 7 again. Daniel 7. Daniel sees the vision of the Ancient of Days, and that's how he describes him. So we're looking at divinity. One who is on the throne. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Somebody look up Micah chapter 4 and verse 13. Who's got that? Micah 4.13. Who wants to get Micah 4.13? The reason we're looking at these is... Okay, Brandy. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion, for I will make your corn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze, so that you may pulverize many peoples and dedicate to the Lord their unjust profit and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. All right, now I looked at the wrong reference. That's for the next verse, verse 15. His feet were like burnished bronze, uh, but for his eyes like a flame of fire. Uh, that's, once again, Daniel 7 and also 10.6. In other words, when you see this description of Jesus, you're not seeing new things. You're seeing references to things that have been revealed centuries before about God and about Christ. So this is not anything new if you are familiar with Scripture. And that's the idea of the apocalypse, away from hiding. It's, it's a code that Christians would have known and would have understood, but it's not really a code at all. It's just understanding these things. Remember last week we talked about if you had a friend come from Mongolia and they knew some English but they didn't really know culture and you started to use terminology uh, that, that was strange. Uh, What did we talk about last week? Knocking it out of the park, maybe? Yeah, knock it. What's, what's that mean, to knock it out of the park? Well, that's a baseball reference. If you understand baseball, you understand what that means. What was the other one? Oh, yeah. I had a friend who was a comedian, and they really bombed. And, you know, oh, there was an explosion? No, it's just a turn of phrase. If you know the turn of phrase, you don't even think about it. You just move on with the conversation because you understand exactly what it meant. But if you don't then you're stuck. And that's why a lot of folks get stuck on the Revelation. They, they don't know the imagery that comes out of the Old Testament. So that's why we're taking a, a look at these things. Let's see what else we've got here that Stafford's provided. That's Laodicea. Didn't finish what they started. Oh, a Philadelphia, rather. Christ set before them an open door. That's why he had the question about the open door set before us. And here's Laodicea. Lukewarm, but had a high opinion of themselves. Know anybody like that? Don't point fingers. Christ asked them to be earnest and repent. It spit them out. If we wander, we should repent. All right. Overcome. How do you overcome? You, you, you hang in there. You keep the faith. That's how you overcome. Those who overcame in the first century were persecuted perhaps unto death, but they stayed faithful. They did not give up the faith. They did not renounce Christ. Nike is a Greek word from which overcome is, is rendered. There are great rewards to those who overcome, but they're not the rewards of this world. This world offers certain rewards. On Facebook, you make a post on Facebook, what do you like to see? People click and like. Oh, I got a lot of likes for that one. Oh, somebody gave me a love. Oh. Somebody wrote something that said, yeah, that's right. This is really profound. That's what you want on Facebook. What if you don't get it? 
Does that mean what you wrote was bad or wrong? One of the things that happens to us in this world is we can be influenced to desire acceptance in this world. And there's nothing wrong with righteous acceptance if, if, if you're doing good and you're accepted. Even When you read about Jesus, it says he grew in favor with God and man. That's good. But eventually what happened to him? Well, he was crucified. And so each of us should, should do the right thing so that we might also grow in favor with God and man, but learn to do the right thing without seeking the world's approval for it. Revelation was written to a people who were not approved of by the Roman government. They were persecuted, tormented. Their lives were very difficult. Peter wrote about that in the first letter. First Peter, he writes about bearing up under persecution and difficulties. Second Peter, he writes about bearing up under false teachings. And all of that you see here in these seven letters. Persecution, false teachers, influences of the world trying to tear down what God has built, which is what the devil has always been doing, trying to tear down what God has built. So with these things in mind, uh, we'll look forward to next week's lesson out of the Revelation. John, uh, Don. Um, when, I, when I first read through the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, and I realized, wow, you got you got to overcome you got to, so what happens, you know, and you look at it, you think, it looks like all the pressure's on you. If they begin to torture me, or if somebody begins to torture you, and I said, oh, okay, I'm not, I, you, you, you just, oh, you do like Peter did. You said, ah, oh, you cuss. I, I'm not, I don't even know this guy. I don't know this, and then you move on. So you didn't overcome that. You going to hell? Are you going to hell? What if, what if you, what if you, I mean, or does God know your attitude saying, Man, I screwed up this time, Lord. I, I, I really want to overcome this next time. I, I, I'm not quitting, you know. Or is it the person that says, okay, yeah, I'm just going to go back into the world because I ain't taking this. Is that, that that type of overcoming? Is it overcoming your faith or do you got to overcome every single sin you got? You see, you see my point? Those who overcome, right. he named sins. He said, you must overcome. And it's easy to look at it. Well, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to overcome every one of these if I don't. Now the pressure's on me to perform to a, to a certain level that I think's good enough to go to heaven rather than, wow, I might fail. I mean, we live in Western Christianity. We haven't been persecuted like this right. ever. And if we, I, Remember, I, I say, we're, I'd, say, I'd venture to say that most of us all of a sudden started, this our is, jobs started really being at hand. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose your job if you do this. We're, we're caving in. And, and, and I'm wondering, if, well, okay, maybe... Maybe I caved in this while okay, now I, I need I need to make a comeback. Lord. And that's the way I deal with it, dealt with it now. It's the only way I can stay close to the Lord. If I think I've got to overcome all these things that it says I have to overcome and the pressure's on me, I'm not going to make it. Right. If I can count on the Lord that if I screw up, you know, just because I didn't get persecuted to avoid persecution one time, well, I'm going to try to make a comeback, Lord. I, I need your help, God. I'm going to need your strength. That's, I mean, that's, that's the way I look at overcoming now. I'm calling on the Lord. Right. And those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's not a lot like a one-time deal. That's every day. That's all the time. That's staying close all the time. That's the way I look at overcoming. Well, if you remember that John's the one who received this revelation. And he, he wrote in 1 John chapter 5 this. It says, Chapter 5, verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes, is, uh, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So when he says our faith is the victory, we've, that'd make a great song, wouldn't it? Faith is the victory. He's not saying... Our perfect behavior is our victory. He's saying our faith is our victory. We observe his commandments. We, I, this is what God wants me to do. I'm not very good at that, but, but that's what I am saying is the right thing, and that's what I'm, I'm working towards. It's like this morning, where we're going to talk about Philippians chapter 2, where Paul writes, work out your own salvation. Well, what do you mean? I thought it was already saved. No, there, there's something about working it out. Every single one of us have a personal responsibility to do something with the salvation God's given us, and it never amounts to 
living, learning to live perfectly. It, it's always about faith. Our, our faith is our victory, believing in Jesus. And you imagine from God's perspective, he's looking down on this world and he sees us struggling, not just struggling with the world, but struggling with ourselves. My flesh, I want to do this, but I know I shouldn't do that. I need to follow Jesus. And so I'm going to try to follow Jesus in this. And when God sees us, little scrawny weaklings, struggling against the flesh and struggling against the world, but the whole thing is we want to get to him. He knows that. He sees that. That's what he says in every letter. I know you. I know you. I know your individual struggle. I know you put me first. I know you think you're not any good at anything, but I'm so proud of you for who and where you are. When, when you have a kid, you're trying to get him to ride a bicycle, and the first time you let them go and they're balancing, what are they doing while they're riding that bike? They're hollering, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I'm riding, look at me, no training wheels. That's, that's us. God is always trying to help us. But, but you don't go right into the Tour de France, do you? Okay, well, all right. Enough said perfect perhaps this morning. Lord willing, we'll come back next week and do some more. Thank you.